at the outset on behalf of Bombay Orthopedic Society and the organizing and the scientific committee, I, Dr. Abhijit Kale and Dr. Ashish Fadnis are delighted to welcome all of you, teachers, friends, residents, fellows and trade partners to Mumbai for the 57th annual conference of Bombay Orthopedic Society, that's Viroc Max 2022. May I ask the Honorable President of Bombay Orthopedic Society, Dr. Rajesh Gandhi, and the Honorable Secretary of, Dr. of the Bombay Orthopedic Society, Dr. Neeraj Bidlani, to join me on stage. Taking a clue from ancient Sanskrit shlok, Annadanam Param Danam Vidya Danam Atah Param Annena Shanikaha Truptihi Yavad Jivanam Cha Vidyaya. The binding force for all of us today is Vidya Dan. May I call upon the Honorable Secretary of Bombay Orthopedics, Dr. Neeraj Bidlani, to take over. Good morning, everyone. I welcome you all to Vyrock Max, Vyrock Maximum 22. Uh, I invite our beloved president, Dr. Rajesh Gandhi to come to the dais and declare the conference open. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. May I invite Executive Council of Bombay Orthopedic Society to please come on the stage. Yeah, we would take great pleasure in inviting IOA President Dr. Atul Srivastava to kindly join us on the stage. We also take great pleasure in inviting IOA President-elect Dr. Ram Chadda to kindly join us on stage. And we also invite Dr. Rajendra Abhyankar, MOA President, to kindly join us on stage. Thank you everyone for being present at the inauguration. I hand over to Dr. Rajesh Gandhi to deliver the inaugural address. Good morning. We dreamt big, my respected teachers, esteemed seniors and dear colleagues. We dreamt of making the Vyrog Max 2022 biggest of all in terms of academics and in terms of the event. Learning has no patent. Here is the platform where we contribute and we learn. Difficulties in the life do not come to destroy you, but to help you realize your hidden potential. Let the difficulties know that you are difficult not easy to be discouraged or defeated. Organizations organizing the event at Geo World Convention Center was a monumental task. I was told it is difficult. Team Vyrock slept with their dreams and woke up with the commitments to follow up those dreams. The efforts 
by the team is stupendous and you have seen the result of the same you have seen the results of the same the event how it is shaped no one succeeds alone no one our theme is motivate innovate integrate we worked our way towards the goal we try to incorporate the newer ideas and hope we have succeeded in delivering the same no one will no none of us will go hungry academically i thank everybody for being present at the inaugural function jai hind may i request everybody to uh, get up and we will do the lamp lighting ceremony please thanks to the honorable president sir for those encouraging words the bombay orthopedic society has the highest regards for your contributions to health and the welfare of mankind orthopedic issues are complex with important ramifications for our nation and our future today bombay orthopedic society is recognized as a role model for other medical associations and wirock is regarded as a benchmark for all the orthopedic conferences in this part of the world today we stand on the shoulders of giant and it has been a continuous persistent and laborious efforts of our seniors founding members founding members which has borne fruits which we savor today as we race into the future academic meetings will become the focus of expectations greater than even before the nation will look to them to carry on our tradition of achievement and success may this conference serve as a forum for exchange of scientific information which will promote and upgrade the quality of research in our country the venue of this of this conference is renowned not only for its grandiosity but also for its rich indian traditional and cultural heritage myself dr abhijit kale and my colleague dr ashish fadnis are humbled to stand before you as the organizing secretary and thank the members of this society for the trust and confidence in bestowing this distinct privilege upon us as we celebrate 57 years of existence of bombay orthopedic society our society has progressed despite adversities that have come along its way the success of this conference is not only the responsibility of the scientific and the organizing committee but also of all the participating delegates and the fellow bos members 
I conclude with a quote, life is short, heights are great to scale. Carve your name on everyone's lips and the world will tell your tale. Long live BOS and may Vyrock Max rocks. Jai Hind. May I request all to... With these concluding remarks, may I declare the conference open and Jai Hind. May I request everybody to please stand up for the national anthem. I thank delegates to be present over here. Now we start with the plenary sessions. Thank you. Thank you, the leaders of the Bombay Orthopedic Society. This is truly a league of extraordinary gentlemen who brought us to this stage. It's been a fantastic start to Vyrock Max. It's indeed been a Vyrock Max and uh, you provided us with a lot of entertainment, a lot of academics. Uh, on behalf of the delegates, we thank you for all the efforts you guys have put in in the last six months. And uh, once again, thank you so much. So going ahead with the plenary sessions for day number two in Hall A. We move on with the series of eponymous lectures and uh, the RJ Katrak oration is uh, synonymous with Vyrock since time immemorial. Dr. Katrak was indeed a torchbearer for orthopedics in um, Western India and all of India and maybe in the world and uh, it is only, uh, only our honor to have the first eponymous lecture to be named after him. Of course, the lecturer for the Katrak oration has to have a standing that matches with the man himself. And uh, we are very, very fortunate to have a person who's not only put perspiration, but also inspired many. Uh, Dr. Sanjay Agarwala will be introduced by um, the convener of the session, our president. But I must say that he's been a teacher to many, and he's uh, one of the true orthopedic surgeons who does everything from spine, hip, arthroscopy. And um, uh, it's indeed a great pleasure to have him as the Katra orator. To um, roll in this session, may I invite our um, esteemed, honorable, friendly, most affable, always smiling president, Rajesh Gandhi, sir. May I invite Dr. Sanjay Agarwala? Please come on the stage, sir.
डॉक्टर संजय अग्रवाला नीड्स नो इंट्रोडक्शन ही इज द डायरेक्टर प्रोफेशनल सर्विसेज एंड हेड ऑफ द ऑर्थोपेडिक्स एट हिंदुजा हॉस्पिटल ही इज ऑल्सो ए विजिटिंग कंसल्टेंट एट ब्रिज कैंड यू हॉस्पिटल इन मुंबई ही इज द फाउंडर ट्रस्टी एंड द पास प्रेसिडेंट ऑफ इश्क ही हैज ओवर एटी फाइव पब्लिकेशन इन पीयर रिव्यूड जर्नल्स एंड ही इज एक्टिव कॉन्ट्रीब्यूटर इन द फील्ड ऑफ रिसर्च इन ऑर्थोपेडिक्स हिज रिसर्च हैज एस्टाब्लिश्ड अ मेड इन इंडिया आत्मनिर्भर सोल्यूशन यूजिंग बिस्फोस्फिनेट सक्सेसफुली फॉर क्रिपलिंग एंड पेनफुल डिसीज ऑफ ए वी एन ही हैज ओवर थर्टी सेवन ईयर्स ऑफ सक्सेसफुल प्रैक्टिस इन एडल्ट रिकन्स्ट्रक्टिव सर्जरी ऑफ द जॉइंट आर्थ्रोप्लास्टी एंड कॉम्प्लेक्स ट्रोमा ही हैज मेंटर्ड मैनी पोस्ट ग्रेड स्टूडेंट्स हु हैज रीजन टू ग्रेट हाइट्स डॉक्टर संजय अग्रवाला हैज सक्सेसफुली ब्लेंडेड द बेस्ट ऑफ द ईस्ट एंड द वेस्ट टू ब्रिंग वर्ल्ड क्लास केयर फॉर द बेनिफिट्स of the indian populations by his large contribution to academics and basic research the years of experience clinical knowledge and surgical excellence have defined his successful career and he continues to give his best to the society i request him to deliver the rj katrak oration sir please come thank you sir earlier on when i had asked rajesh who do i thank he said sir bombay orthopedic society so with that i thank bombay orthopedic society for having selected me 2 years ago for the next group of bos members to have agreed and for the present bos executive to have me on stage today the katra coration as you know is the foremost eponymous lecture that is given in the viroc at the katra coration dr sanjay agarwal of hinduja hospital uh, dr agarwal thank you for being with us and let's have a let's say a warm hello to everyone at viroc the western india regional orthopedic conference where you are giving this oration let's say a big hello to them at the start hello so, hello i am here the late dr r j kathrak was born in the 19th century he serviced orthopedics in the 20th century and today in the 21st century we still remember him he was a general surgeon and then decided he would be an orthopedic surgeon went to do his mch orth in england in 1936 when general surgeons were actually rendering orthopedic services came back during the war was at jj hospital bj wadia hospital doing conservative rather than very aggressive pediatric orthopedic care went on to be at km and at sion an outstanding achievement for someone who visited four different hospitals in his lifetime he was the founder president of the bombay orthopedic club which then became the bombay orthopedic society and the first indian fellow of the british orthopedic association he was an outstanding teacher is very clear he was the teacher to dr ak talwalkar dr ln vora who i had the privilege of being registrar for two years during my ms he had an outstanding memory almost photographic and dr k t dolakia who i worked with for 18 years when he would come to pd hinduja hospital dr dolakia would stay the night rehearse the operation and write the procedure on his hand the fate of the patient was not in the hands of the patient it was on the hands of dr kt dolakia and many of us who have worked with him and interacted with him know what an outstanding man he was and dr rj kathrak was his teacher what drives you who so what drives me that's the whole idea of this rj kathrak oration i think it's inspiration with perspiration it's a winning combination and as has already been explained my journey if i have seen 
further than others, it is by standing upon the shoulders of giant, a cliche. But truly, these were the giants I worked with. I was a house officer with Dr. R.M. Bansali. I had Dr. Pradhan and SKB, Dr. Bandare, as the vice or deputy honoraries at that time. I was a student of Dr. M. N. Shahane, and the only and first student of his who actually had the privilege and the occasion to work with him because I was assigned to the Ellen Bora unit. Dr. Saraf, an outstanding man, he would say, Beta, start karo, khatam mat karna. So I had a lot of surgical experience because of Dr. Saraf. And Dr. Ingalikar, Dr. Joshi Pura, Dr. Chowal were the contemporary teachers of our times. And I think those were the shoulders on whom I stood. KM was, of course, the alma mater. I gathered a couple of first ranks, a couple of medals. But the turning point in my career was when I got the International Graduate Fellowship Award of the Rotary Foundation. I pipped a man no other than the current dean of Harvard University, Dr. Datar, and the two of us were the final contenders, and this must be the only time that Dr. Datar has ever been beaten by anyone, it was me. I went on to Oswestry in 1982 under Professor Brian O'Connor. In those days, there were only six professors in the entire UK. He was one of them. I went to Northwick Park Hospital in 84, worked with Leslie Kleneman, whose interest was foot, and later on, Leslie Kleinman became the professor of orthopedics at Liverpool. At Liverpool in 1985, I won the Ra Norman Roberts Medal, which was generally not given to a lot of outsiders. And Norman Roberts himself was alive on the day that this was presented to me. I went to Johns Hopkins to do a fellowship with Schmeiser and Stoke and Trent in 1986 before returning to India to the PD Hinduja Hospital, where I've been for the last 37 years. Breach Candy Hospital is where I also have an affiliation. And I think I'm a clinical scientist, a clinician and a scientist, because I have authored over 100 peer-reviewed papers. I'm not going to take you through my 100 papers, but I'll take you through papers that really matter and the ones that will work for you. So every time I meet you, uh, something good happens. Either my film becomes a hit or I get a nice film, so I'm hoping something else happens. So wow, she said that some of her success was due to me. And these are the kind of privileges I've had working at the Hinduja Hospital. At Derby, I did hand surgery with Frank Burke, who took the mantle of the unit which was started by Guy Pulvertaft. You will remember Pulvertaft sutures. And having done this hand surgery, I started using the surgical microscope for replantation surgeries and came back to India and started the replantation program at Hinduja Hospital. My interest took me to write papers in the British Journal of Plastic Surgery using nerve conduits. I used Gore-Tex for nerve conduit successfully. However, the spine was what I was introduced to by Dr. M. N. Shahane and my Harrington Rod fixation paper, which was my thesis, also won the Masalawala Award at the Wairock way back in 1982. Having worked with John Dove, I brought back to India the heart cell rectangle fixation. Thereafter, the heart cell rectangle was copied. I think Pitker was the first people who copied it for me. John Dove was very annoyed that I was having it copied, but that was the only way I could do segmental spinal fusion. But microlumbar discectomy, because I had an interest in the use of the surgical microscope, I brought to India. And in fact, I don't know if Dr. Ingalaykar is here, but I was the an invited speaker for his Asia Pacific at the Taj in 1987-89 when uh, he asked me to talk about microlumbar discectomy. No one for either neurosurgery or spine was doing microlumbar discectomy at that time. Thanks to the largesse of my trustees, 
They bought me the Holmium laser machine, almost a crore in those days, difficult to buy, and I was doing YAG, Holmium YAG laser-assisted disc decompression successfully under local anesthesia. But I think there is a reason why there is a phrase in English, pain in the back and pain in the spine, it never seems to go away. The good patients would do very, very well. The bad patients kept coming back to haunt you. And I decided I would do some trauma. And trauma is something that we all learned when I was at KEM and when I was in England and when we did the AO courses, we learned from our skills to do trauma. Just hope you can fix the damage done. And we were fixing the damage done. Recognizing that there were certain shortfalls and recognizing the need for some innovation, I realized that fixing distal radius fractures would be a great thing. This met with a certain degree of criticism from senior orthopedic surgeons stating that this was totally overkill. I had to publish it and the only journal that would accept it in that time was the Bombay Hospital Journal. I published it to show that this was the way of the future for Coley's fractures. And now it's virtually a standard of care. Patients, and you'll recognize this very old plate right in the beginning, and the patient was able to do this in 10 days time. If he was a surgeon, or if even if he was a taxi driver, this was the way forward for the treatment of Coley's fracture. Patella fixation, 1% of all fractures that come to a busy trauma practice are patella fractures. That is the statistics. If you do the Mueller technique, the KOR keeps backing out. I described the technique where I combined Schauwecker's figure of eight with the pry ford, and essentially once you have the figure eight, the pry ford, you can add one or two wires more, the patient heals. And my colleagues at Hinduja Hospital have seen this again and again. Patients are walking within one day of the surgery and there is no risk of the K wire backing out. We were seeing a certain number of tendo Achilles and all these repairs would break down because of skin complications. I described in the Journal of Foot and Ankle Surgery in the Asia Pacific region how I would do a minimal access, and maybe I can show it to you here. I would come through the skin here, go back through the same skin incision, and cut the bridge with a 15 number blade or 11 number blade. So effectively now, I had a percutaneous technique in this portion, and therefore these wounds would do very, very well. We were dealing with atypical fractures again and again, and none of them because of my bisphosphonates. And there was a problem getting these to heal. And I suggested and published that vigorous endosteal reaming across fracture sites aids union. And let me show you this in a little expanded version. You can probably see here how there's a cloud of bone formation. You take the reamer 10 times across the fracture. This cloud then remains here and aids the healing, and therefore even these difficult fractures can heal better if you are electing to nail them, if you've done vigorous endosteal uh, reaming in this portion. We published all this. Ankle fractures, particularly the fibula, if you try to do the Weber and Vassy anti-glide technique, the fracture shifts. Recognizing this, I started twisting the plate and published this in 2020, where I would twist the LCP, a strong plate, and put it across so that it would conform, and then the results were excellent. I don't think AO copied me, but simultaneously they were working on similar principles, and their, their new plate has got a twist in it. My use of medicines to get fractures to heal is legendary. I've also repurposed denosumab for recalcitrant bone healing, published in the BMJ, 
And then if you wonder what technique I use, you just need to put Agarwala in BMJ for recalcitrant bone healing and you'll find the paper. Now, trauma clearly brought me to be able to... So we, I treated people. She went on after this foot injury that she had and they were all worried that she would never dance again. That was her career. She went on immediately after that to dance in the movie Devdas. Surgical management of arthritis was, of course, something that was of interest to me. So when I came back from England, I recognized that there was a place for a high tibial osteotomy. But the staple that we were using was very, very loose. I added and created the box osteotomy where I had a ledge at the back and a ledge in front. When this closed along with the staple, this locked like a box, and this was a stable way of doing a high tibial osteotomy, a lateral closed wedge. The patients did well. When AO introduced their locking plates, I thought that was even a better way of holding the fracture and I didn't need any plaster supports, etc. And these worked well as well. Soon after, I realized that the biplanar osteotomy of the AO, which was an open biplanar osteotomy, was an excellent way of doing high tibial osteotomies. And note the ledge that even they have preserved here. Or can, they have this ledge here, and that's the ledge which allows for greater contact and therefore greater stability of the high tibial osteotomy. So I'm not saying they copied me, but I think they were also working similarly on similar principles. And this kind of a patient did well. But like I said, I recognized that even though there was this box osteotomy that was eponymous with my name, the open wedge osteotomy was better because it had better outcomes. In turn, when we became members of Aishka, I was a founding member, founding trustee, became president, I realized that we really needed to get our patients in and out faster. And Dr. Pachure is here, you'll remember, we used to keep patients for two, two weeks in the early, early days when we were working with Dr. Dolakia, which was a great way for the patient to get confidence, but the average length of stay, the ALOS, was tremendously long. And all of us, I think, all over the country, worked at working towards fast track recovery. I published this some time ago. And what, even Mogambo bhi khush ho gaya isse, patients were comfortable to go home on the second day. Preoperative or perioperative education and physiotherapy, of course, helped. Periarticular infiltration was helpful. We do adductor canal blocks along with the periarticular because then that works extremely well for the back of the knee, ice packs, prophylaxis, anticoagulants, DVD socks, and intermittent compression so devices all the time with immediate mobilization. Because I really believe DVT is a problem. So, the common belief is that Indians don't get DVT. My work, and you notice the date, 2002, 2003, showed that DVT exists in Indian patients and can be prevented with prophylaxis. An issue that's not been recognized is that MRSA affects Indian patients. Methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. We published it. There is a prevalence, surprisingly, of MRSA. Screening prior to all elective surgery helps you identify it. Three days of mupirocin in the nose and axilla clears the colonization. In fact, just four or five days ago, I had a total hip replacement, which I canceled because he was methicillin resistant staph aureus isolated in his nose. 
post surgery patients hate the staple removal it hurts might hurt for only 1 minute but it hurts and a physical follow up is required i have a certain cohort of patients who come from outside of bombay even new bombay or maybe even satara now those kind of patients they need to reach a doctor and often their fear is when they go to their local doctor he will say jidhar karaya tha udhar jao sad but it is true i have introduced this concealed cosmetic closure for total knee replacement surgery and it's a superior cosmetic healing it has minimal complications and great satisfaction for the patient here is a hip replacement about 8 days after surgery he's come to my clinic i am removing the dressing for the first time and that's it he could have gone to dubai and done this he could have had it done in delhi wherever he came from this is the way to be so that the patient does not have to worry about suture removal of course now coming to replacements of hip and knee i have been found a member of ash current trusty past president my greatest concern was that we would get patients who wanted hip and knee surgery and we would tell all these patients you can only sit on a chair for the last 25 years i have been offering all my patients this degree of mobility i'm going to share some of this with you i think the magic in our hands is when we can give normal joint function after replacement and look at the population asia and africa that's 78 80% of the world china india southeast asia the middle east and africa these are the requirements and this after standard replacement surgery we say is not allowed western culture requirements we claim is this they kneel if they go to church if they play golf they need to be sitting like this and should we be telling them that they have restricted movements we've not done them any great favors mayo clinic handout avoid crossing twisting your legs avoid bending from your waist more than 90 degrees don't bring your knee up higher than your hip don't reach down to pull blankets when lying in bed this is crippling this is what i offer all my hip replacements and i'll share how and all my knee replacements and i'll share how and i think this is what we should as surgeons be offering our patients there is an armamentarium and just like maki farar showed that large heads work we have seen how the bhr which i still think has place how delta motion great prosthesis used to work unlike the asr great prosthesis did not work but has been withdrawn because there must have been problems but the principle of a large head is of course a great principle and we published this a retrospective analysis of our midterm results and when andy murray needed a hip replacement he opted for the large head bhr so large heads would give this kind of range of movement we understand however sometimes when the muscles are weak and you have a patient with polio or you have a patient with a tc fracture he also you cannot expect someone to prevent him from doing things that he has done for the last 70 years of his life you offer him a dual mobility and we published about this dual mobility how this is a great prosthesis evolutus is one of the companies striker is another and the whole lot of companies now offering it is available freely now in india is something to adopt but the magic the magic is in getting the same stability and function with a standard thr and i test for impingement and free hip stability i do an anterior approach as most of you know and does that work well we check and there are a whole lot of nuances to doing this but if the patient has this degree of stability 
this is the patient who can dance. And I asked Yogesh Patkar, who you've seen on ZTV, whether I could use his video from YouTube. He says, hi, please do that. And this is what I did for him. This man is dancing and he's sitting on the floor like a normal person. This is the magic which is in the hands of all of you. Adapt God, God, this is this is and do it. So, what Mayo Clinic has told the world, at my hands, it doesn't matter. We can get them to get full range of movement. Along with Dr. Junyanwala, Dr. Pachure and I, we wrote about this paper where we did revisions. Of course, we would be doing revisions because we were doing primary hips. When you have a trunnion and you want to preserve the, the prosthesis in the femur, you want to save the trunnion and you can't be putting things like gauze pieces and things that will work. All you need is a Foley catheter. You roll it, it saves it, and you can get along and revise your acetabulum. We published this in the Annals of the Royal College of Surgeons of England. Likewise for total knees. I don't want to restrict their movements. Do I have something that I can use for the total knee? Yes, I do. In the quest for the high flex total knee, I started using the RPF. The problem with the RPF I found, and when I spoke to the designer surgeon, he said, Sanjay, you should publish it, challenged me to do it. I published it in the Journal of Arthroplasty. This is what was happening with the RPF, the patella clunk. Thereafter, the company changed the model, and finally they've withdrawn it, unfortunately, but clearly there were problems with that. I have been using the Smith & Nephew currently, that's the auxinium. It gives me a great range. I have a PS, the high flex, the constraint. Give me a second life when he did my knees. And patients can get normal knees. Here's a patient who came to me with fixed flexion deformity, pre-op, day one of surgery, and I told you I do very fast mobilization, two weeks, and at one month. I have a patient who's come from a village. I can't expect this patient to use a commode. I have them get normal movements. Yet another patient with a knee replacement, and this I give to 99% of my patients for the last 25 years. Hips and knees with full movements. That's the right way to do it. And I think you all should also adapt and adopt the techniques which are required to get this kind of movement. Now we come to bisphosphonates, the avascular necrosis. I've been doing this for 25 years. Transient osteoporosis, spontaneous osteonecrosis, AVN in post-leukemia, AVN other than hip, and post-COVID AVN. Now, COVID is all around us. These are all the papers that have been spawned by my interest in managing AVN. Give us your magic pills all the time. <laughs> and that's Helen saying, give us the magic pills. My 20-year study was published in 21 in the JBJS. And the most recent publication, which is waiting to be published and has been accepted by the American JBJS in September, is about COVID and AVN. And anyone who is practicing orthopedics in this lot has seen AVN after COVID 101%. I am going to show you how to treat this without surgery. I've been publishing since 2001. When I say publishing from 2001, believe me, I was working on it five years before that. You cannot publish, start today and publish tomorrow. So I've been doing this, like I said, for 25 years. We have multiple publications and it has spawned a whole lot of publications over a period of time. If you have smartphones and you wish to take this protocol, I would recommend it. I'm going to show it to you again in about another two or three minutes. You need to give zolendronic acid once a year. You need to give alendronate in small doses. I used to, I had started by giving 10 milligrams, but the companies have withdrawn that. 70 milligrams 
is less absorbed. You need to give calcium and vitamin D and let's look at the rationale. Why a combination of two bisphosphonates? Alandonate is efficacious. Publications, look at a publication number four, 2005. Publication five, 2006. I published in 2001. The fact of the matter is that the effect of alandonate starts only after 12 weeks, up to one year. A patient who's in pain is not going to wait. The reason is alandonate at the best of times is a is only absorbed by 2%. So if pain improvement is late, patient is going to withdraw from your treatment and there will be decreased compliance. In 2013, 13, 2006, five years after my publication, 2010, people used only intravenous bisphosphonates and showed that it was not effective you would get early blood levels, some pain improvement, but it didn't work. Of course it wouldn't work. You're not treating osteoporosis, you're treating an acute disease. In 2002, there was this scientific paper which showed that resorption of necrotic bone is prevented in rat animals by doses which are four to 50 times higher than for osteoporosis. You cannot treat AVN with the same dose that you would treat osteoporosis. We recognized that edema was settling down and in 2019 I published the transient osteoporosis of the hip. You have seen these cases, extremely painful. Some even opt for surgery. At four months disappeared after you use bisphosphonates. Yet another case. I don't want to take you through multiple cases, but this is proved by literature and my publications. Spunk, spontaneous osteonecrosis of the knee. Same thing at presentation and four months. I was in Belgium and they were operating a patient of spunk because the patient had so much pain. If they had done my treatment and waited maybe six weeks, the patient would have resolved. This is confirmatory evidence that you can see in these publications. So our rationale is you give zolendronic acid, which gives you early blood levels, pain relief because it reduces edema. You give oral alendronate, prevents collapse. Combined therapy, the treatment protocol for those of you who didn't get a chance to take this picture. Give this, this will work. The natural history of AVN is three years. You need to give this for three years unless you're doing multiple MRIs and patient as well. You can stop it earlier. And the established safety of bisphosphonate is three years. So I have repurposed this drug. The drug repurposing is the practice of finding novel therapeutic indications for existing approved drugs. Now these are just some of the examples. There are hundreds of drugs which have been repurposed. I grew up taking aspirin for my fevers when I was a child. Chloroquine, you treat malaria with four stat, two after six hours, one BD for two days. We all know that, but when you use chloroquine for rheumatoid arthritis, the dose is different. Same thing with bisphosphonates for AVN, spunk, and transient osteoporosis. We have repurposed denosumab for recalcitrant bone healing when you have well-fixed fractures. And look at this, not healing, nine months healing. You can see how this callus is formed with the use of denosumab in the right doses. Coming back to AVN, this is just some illustrative examples. Stage two, bilateral, look at him at four years, doing well. Case of stage three, almost stage four. I mean, there's a little bit of arthritis, you could say. At presentation, at three years, at 12 years, we've avoided surgery for this patient. I think I've done him a service. And this is what is critical. Whether you're drilling it, you're doing forage, whether you're doing stem cells, or whether you're doing platelets, can you assure 98% in stage one, 92% in stage two, and 77 in stage three? 
If the answer is no, then you are doing a disservice by offering that patient surgery. And this is all published data. You can check it up, 15 publications. It's all there in that. And I've not seen any case of atypical fractures and osteonecrosis because we confined it for three years. I think I have rewritten the chapter of management of AVN. AVN in leukemia. You have acute lymphoblastic edema in very, very small children. Young children, would you be offering these patients a crippled life or would you offer them a total hip replacement? I think at four years, if the patient can do this, I think she's doing very well. It's a young child. As a hip replacement surgeon, should I have been telling him stay crippled till you are an adult? Or should I be saying get a hip replacement at that young age? This patient did well and there he is. He is doing all activities that his brother can do. Avascular necrosis other than hip. Well, there it is. The talus, you can see. Scaphoid, treated without surgery, with bisphosphonates. Lunate, cane box, treated. And now we come to COVID. We are living with it. I'm, all of us are carrying masks. And we've seen this. I published this in BMJ very recently. And what we saw that in COVID, the mean dose of steroid in world literature was 2,000 milligrams. You can get AVN. Our study showed about 350 milligrams. And our study showed that it was happening much faster. So COVID is a disastrous disease for the bones. A low dose of steroid and a very early onset of AVN is happening. And this has been written up. We have been seeing this too in our patients. And again, what have we done? We've treated this medically. This has been accepted for publication by the American JBJS. Should be in print in the next couple of weeks. I have a medical line of treatment successful for the management of AVN of these patients. And every single one of you who's practicing has seen COVID AVNs right now. And that's the kind of team I work with. I mean, huge team. In fact, there are a whole lot of people in the front row here who worked with me and worked along with me. And that's the kind of team I work with. And there you can see Dr. Bhalera, who was my teacher and he was my colleague in Hinduja, Dr. F.D. Dastur, and Dr. Davar, Dr. Tempton Udwadia, Dr. V.R. Joshi. And that's my team. I work with a team. Team is everything. Mbabwe, great player. Team let him down. The other chap, the team helped him. So he took the World Cup. I think 1% inspiration, but 99% perspiration, as Thomas Edison said, work should be evidence-based all the time. Whatever is different must be studied, and novel treatments must be shared. That's what BOS is for, Wyrock is for, and what all of us as colleagues are for, ideas, motivation, creativity. And you need to put in your hard work, the effort, and the determination to turn the ideas into reality so that they can be shared in forums like this or amongst your colleagues. The impossible we are doing all the time. You and I are doing this impossible things all the time. It's miracles that take a little longer. Thank you.
truly motivational, Dr. Agarwala. And uh, we are so proud to have you as one of us. Uh, we are so proud that you were the Katra Corator for this year. And uh, we learned a lot from what you have learned. Thank you for sharing all those fantastic ideas. And it's indeed a great start to our series of eponymous lectures. Thank you again. Moving on, we move on to possibly the most exciting part of the morning, and that is the presidential guest lecture. Now, this uh, lecture series could have gone to the president himself, but you know he's a humble man, and he decided that uh, he should get some inspirational personalities to bring out the supermen amongst us. So we have three top-class speakers who have done seminal work on their own account, and uh, you will be introduced to these speakers very soon. Um, the presidential guest lecture hopes that at the end of this session, you know, you go out inspired and do things that you never dreamt of doing. May I invite Dr. Rajesh Gandhi to convene this session and to bring our first rock star speaker on stage. He's a rock star uh, surgeon himself. Dr. Anand Joshi, could you please escort Mr. Viren Raskina? <coughs> of them. Thank you. Dr. Okay. I would request Dr. Anand Joshi to introduce Mr. Viren Raskina. Morning. When Viren received an invite for this program, he was a bit worried. How would he be introduced to this elite group of orthopedic surgeons, some of whom who do not even know the difference between a hockey stick and a walking stick? So Viren, in all sincerity, sent his CV to us with attested mark sheets. So we now know that Viren is a Bandra boy who passed out from St. Stanislaus, did his BCom from the MMK college in Bandra. Now when you know that somebody is from Bandra, you know that he has to be good in sports and also that there will be many Sandras from Bandras who will be after him. So coming from his uh, mate who has been with him from the age of 13, playing both football and hockey with him, Viren was proficient in football as much as in hockey and he would probably represent India either in football and hockey. And of course, like we all suspect, Viren had quite a female following from his early school days, back when he had a lot of hair on his head. <laughs> Viren's wizardry with the hockey stick decided that he favoured hockey over football. And we know what he has done on, in the field of hockey. He was a midfielder who is basically a multitasker. He needs to play both defence and offence. And the attributes for becoming a midfielder are you have to be fit, fast and excellent acceleration. Now, although this is, sounds very simple, this is what M.M. Somaya, a triple Olympian himself, has to say about Viren. As a midfielder, Viren was the link between defence and front line for his team. When the opposition attacked, he was like a shield. When his own team attacked, he would be the springboard for the front line and he was an end-to-end -end player. He covered the ground from his own circle to the attacking circle. As a midfielder, he was the steam of the engine and he did a selfless job without hogging the limelight. He was an exceptional leader in the middle of the pitch. Viren has a lot of laurels to his credit he represented India in the 1990 junior 
international uh, hockey tournament in Hobart. He was part of the junior uh, World Cup uh, team. He has debuted in senior hockey from 2002 and was a member uh, of the Indian team at the Olympics and also captained the Indian hockey team against Pakistan. What is most important, however, for an amateur athlete is achieving the highest accolade that one can hope for and Viren is an Olympian. After playing 180 international games, Viren retired from international hockey and completed his MBA in 2009. He decided to give back to sports what sports had given him and he worked effortlessly off the field as well and currently he is the MD and CEO of the Olympic Gold Quest, a non-profit organization. All peers seem to have extremely high opinions about Viren. This is from Cedric D'Souza, who was the coach of the Indian hockey team. He says Viren was an extremely brainy player who used his intelligence and vision to be extremely effective on the field. As a CEO of OGQ, through his sporting knowledge and passion, he has ensured that athletes get the world's best trainers, facilities and exposure, which has put India on the map with so many medals. Viren's work on and off the field have been widely appreciated and acknowledged. He, has, he is a recipient of the Shiva Chhatrapati Award, the Arjuna Award. He is on the PMO's Olympic Preparation Task Force since 2006 after the Rio Olympics. And in 2017, he was named as one of the top 40 under 40 leaders in India by the Economic Times. So here we have Viren, hockey player, Arjuna Award winner par excellence, uh, hockey player par excellence, and MD and CEO of the OGQ. Ladies and gentlemen, Viren Rajkina. Thank you, Dr. So that's to go forward. That's to go back. In case you want to point to something. Just give me one second. Hi. <coughs> Mic test. Yeah. <coughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Joshi, for such a kind introduction. Uh, it's very strange for me to see uh, Dr. Joshi in, in, in formal clothes today. He, he, uh, he's extremely formally dressed for me. I've only seen him in shorts generally. So, uh, uh, Dr. Joshi, good to see you uh, wearing trousers today. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me over here. I'm a, I'm a hockey player, so it's hard for me to stand in one position. So, if you don't mind, I'm going to be walking around uh, uh, a little bit. Uh, you know, actually... Dr. Joshi told me, uh, told you all a little bit about my background growing up in Bang, uh, Bandra. I actually came from a very conservative middle class family and you know how, how it was back in the days in uh, the 80s and 90s, right? Uh, mom was a doctor, uh, by, by the way, so I have immense respect for all doctors. She was at Bandra Baba Hospital. She was a pediatrician over there for almost 35 years and uh, uh, you know, I used to see the crowds every single day lined up at Baba Hospital and, and, and for me, uh, doctors are gods uh, and, 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 and so I'm tremendously honored to be here. Thank you, Dr. Gandhi, for inviting me. Uh, so, mom was a doctor, dad was an engineer and back in the 80s, 90s, you know, uh, if you had to be something in society, you had to become a doctor or an engineer. And I remember my parents being extremely strict with my eldest brother. My family was a sports-loving family, but no one really played any competitive sport. So, uh, uh, parents were super strict with my eldest brother, and he eventually became an engineer. They, they were medium strict with my second brother. He was a very good football player, played at a very high level. Eventually, he also became an engineer. And I was the third and lucky one because by the time I came along, my parents were not bothered at all. And, and that's how I could actually play hockey. Uh, I remember in, uh, in 1996, the Atlanta Olympics, an Indian tennis player won a medal for India. Can anyone, uh, anyone remember? 
Leander, Leander, and I was a young teenager watching back at home on TV. And for me, actually, that was my moment of inspiration because like Leander, I wanted to play for India. Obviously, hockey was my sport, so I wanted to play hockey for India. I wanted to captain the Indian hockey team. I wanted to play at the Olympics. I wanted to win an Olympic medal. I was very lucky that my first three dreams got fulfilled. But the final one of actually winning an Olympic medal myself as a player, that remained unfulfilled. I played at Athens 2004, and I want to narrate a story uh, uh, from Athens 2004. So India was playing Australia in a very crucial league match. And uh, as you know, like in cricket, Australia is a very strong team in hockey as well. India had to beat Australia to come to the semi-finals of Athens. For Australia, a draw was enough to go through. We were leading 1-0 in the first half. Australia equalized. They made it one all. Th that time, by the way, hockey was two halves of 35 minutes. Now the game has changed. It's become four quarters of 15 minutes each. In the second half, Dandraj Pille, you all know Dandraj. Dandraj got a yellow card. And India were down to 10 men for 10 minutes. Now, it's hard playing against Australia, 10, uh, 11 versus 11. It's bordering on the impossible to keep up with them, 10 versus 11 for 10 minutes. In that 10-minute period, Australia scored two goals. They were, they were leading us 3-1. Dandraj came back on the pitch. India made it 3-2. With seven minutes left on the clock, India made it three all. We, but it was not enough. We had to find the winning goal. We were throwing the kitchen sink at Australia. With four minutes left on the clock, India hit the Australian post. The ball hit the post and came back into play. In the last 10 minutes, India had five penalty corners, but their goalkeeper had a great night. He saved everything we threw at them. With 52 seconds left on the clock, India had a free hit on top of the Australian D area. Except our goalkeeper, all, of, all 10 of us went on top to try and score. And then what happened in that last minute happened in a blur. Because in our urgency to try and score, one of us made a mistake. The Australians intercepted the ball in their D area. They counter-attacked us. And with 20 seconds left on the clock, Australia scored the winning goal that night. Australia won that match 4-3. Uh, that match finished, I remember, around 10 p.m. Athens time. I was crying on the sidelines till around 12 midnight. Because for me, it was around seven years of effort that had gone into preparing for the Olympics. I was possibly in the best shape of my life, had worked as hard as I possibly could. And then that moment came and passed very quickly. <clears throat> I remember being very angry and frustrated, not because India lost, not because one of us made a mistake, I was just angry and frustrated at the system which I felt did not gear us well enough to handle the pressure against the best teams in the world when it really mattered. And at that highest level of sport, it's actually the one, it boils down to the one percenters. Because the difference between the best teams in the world and those who just participate are at that final mile when you have nothing left in the tank, when your heartbeat is literally at 200 beats a minute, you have nothing left, you have no strength. And, and then to summon somehow the energy, to somehow the, uh, uh, summon the concentration, to not make errors, and to, because against the best teams in the world, you'll get maybe one or two chances in the game. If you don't miss it, if, if you miss it, you'll get punished with a goal uh, behind you. That Australian men's hockey team went on to win the gold medal at Athens 2004 for the first time ever in their history. And India and me only participated. And that's why I say the difference between winning gold and maybe just participating can actually boil down to uh, maybe 20 seconds on the clock or the width of a goal post. I retired, a, a, a few, uh, I, I played for a few years later, retired at a very early age. I, I went to do my MBA. Uh, and, and then I happened to meet two very, uh, two, two legends of Indian sport. I'm sure you'll all know them, Geet Sethi and, and, and Prakash Padukone. Uh, Geet Sethi, as you know, is a nine-time world uh, uh, billiards champion. Uh, Prakash Padukone, I have to tell many youngsters that he's not just Deepika's father. 
he's, he's played a little bit of badminton in his life and they had started this not-for-profit organization called Olympic Gold Quest with a very sharp mission to help Indian athletes win Olympic gold medals. And they were looking for a CEO. Now, uh, this was back in 2009. Now, Geet and uh, Prakash were gods for me as well. I, I could not say no to them. And I just felt that OGQ gave me the platform to help the next generation of athletes do something that I couldn't do myself, which is help Indian athletes win Olympic uh, gold medals. Uh, I'm, I'm going to tell you a few stories about OJQ and the journey of those champions. I'm going to tell you two stories about, you all all know uh, athletes like PV Sindhu, Mirabai Chanu, etc., who have won medals for India. Sindhu has won two. But maybe what you all don't know so much is the actually the blood, sweat and tears that went in the lead up to the, in that journey to, to the Olympic podium. So I'm going to share a, a couple of stories with that. But before that, I'm going to request my friend Anand to kindly uh, play a small video. Just to give you context, uh, OGQ looks after the training and preparation of some of India's best athletes preparing for the Olympics and Paralympics. The Commonwealth Games is an important stepping stone. We're very proud to say that at the recent Tokyo Olympics uh, last year, India won seven medals. The training of four of the seven medal winners was looked after by OGQ. And in the, thank you. At the Tokyo Paralympics, India won 19 medals. To give you context, the highest number before that was just four. And the training of 10 of those 19 medal winners was looked after by OGQ. The video I'm about to show you is from the recent Commonwealth Games in Birmingham. It's an important stepping stone in the lead up to the Olympics, Commonwealth Games, Asian Games, World Cups, World Championships. These are all important stepping stones. 23 athletes supported by us participated at the Birmingham, uh, Birmingham Commonwealth Games. 17 won medals, including 12 gold medals. You will see all the medal winners uh, over here. If I can request Anand to kindly play the video. Yeah, you can be the greatest, you can be the best. You can be the king, calm, banging on your chest. You can beat the world, you can beat the war. Talk the guy go banging on his door You can throw your hands up, you can beat the clock yeah. You can move a mountain, you can break rocks You can be a master, don't wait for luck Dedicate yourself and you can find yourself Standing in the Hall of Fame yeah. And the world's gonna know your name yeah. Cause you found Straight through hell with a smile You could be the hero, you could get the gold Breaking all the records they thought never could be broke Yeah, do it for your people, do it for your pride And you're never gonna know if you never even try Do it for your country, do it for your name Cause there gonna be a day when you're standing in the hall of fame Allowed to clap louder also. Okay. <laughs> okay. It, it it takes just six grams of gold to lift the worth of a nation. 
Six grams of gold? That's the weight of pure gold in an Olympic gold medal. And the journey to that podium and to that gold is, is actually hell. And in sport, what generally happens is we see the final effort, but actually, I, I want to talk to you a little bit about what goes behind the scenes over here. At the Tokyo, Tokyo Olympics, I thought I'd do a comparison with some of the big nations in the medal table. India has 1.3 billion population. I looked at China, I looked at uh, uh, the US, Great Britain, Germany, Australia, etc. But in terms of medals, they're far out of reach. So I thought I'd do a comparison with a nation that's closer to us in terms of medals. I looked at Hungary. I googled Hungary's population 10 million, which is basically the population of Dada railway station on Monday morning at 9 a.m. Okay, and India won seven medals at Tokyo. Can anyone guess how many medals did Hungary win at Tokyo? Hungary, small dot on the map. We'll take one minute to find where Hungary is on the map. Hungary won 20 medals overall, including six gold medals. And when we actually analyze what is Hung Hungary doesn't have more facilities than her. They don't have smarter doctors than us. They don't have uh, 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 more money than us. And yet, Hungary is winning 20 medals at the Olympics, the ultimate stage of world sport where you're competing against the best in the world. And one of the things that nations like Hungary do really well is focus intensely on a few sports that they're really good at and go deep. And, and that's one of the lessons we learned to win Olympic medals. You have to just focus, focus, focus. Uh, like I uh, uh, said, uh, you know, growing up, uh, I remember I had so many injuries during my ho hockey is a contact sport. I had four fingers, just four fractures just on the fingers of my right hand uh, during my playing career. Every time I had a fracture, I was out for approximately three months. So I lost one year just because of four fractures on my right hand, leaving aside the other injuries I had throughout my career. So, and I remember at that time, early 90s, late 2000s, uh, we didn't have the best doctors. We didn't have the best support team, physios, trainers, nutritionists, mental trainers. I would be running from pillar uh, to post. I don't know whether Dr. Narvekar is here. I used to see Dr. Narvekar for my knee at uh, 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 that time. Uh, and now things are much, much improved. And, and, and the easiest thing we can do is complain and grumble and say that India's shit, facilities are bad, coaches are useless. But I think what I loved about Geet and Prakash is they never complain. They, want, they wanted to do something to actually make a difference. I'm going to tell you about Sindhu's uh, uh, story. Uh, for me, one of easily the greatest athletes India has ever produced, male or female, at the Olympics. Everyone knows Sindhu today as one of India's best, but actually we started supporting her when she was 13 years old, a little girl in school. And I remember at that time, uh, we were researching on this young girl who was beating kids three years elder to her. That almost never happens in a physical sport. We started supporting her uh, immediately. I remember on day one, I went to Hyderabad, uh, Gachibali, I met Gopi and her parents, and I asked them if there's one thing that OGQ could do for Sindhu, what would it be? And they unanimously said international exposure for training and competition because Sindhu was not in the Indian team. Uh, her parents did not have the funds to send her abroad for training, so she was not getting any international exposure. OGQ was a new not-for-profit organization in 2009. We didn't have any money, but what we had was a lot of belief in Sindhu's ability. We somehow put together the funds to send her for three international, uh, sorry, five international tournaments abroad with a coach and a physio. That was the time she won her first senior international tournament, a Chotusa tournament, Maldives International Challenge, but very big in terms of the confidence it gave a young girl. At the age of 17, Sindhu started playing super series tournaments, the highest level of women's international badminton tournaments. That first year, Sindhu played 12 tournaments, 10 tournaments she lost in the first round. And you can imagine the, the hit it took to confidence of a young 17-year-old girl. And in India, you know how it is, right? At the age of 15 and 17, you make decisions in life. Should I study or should I play? Sindhu's elder sister, by the way, is a doctor. And, and uh, when you're losing not once, not twice, not thrice, 10 times, you, there seems to be no light at the end of the tunnel. 
Sindhu almost quit badminton that year. I saw her th I've seen her throw her racket on the floor in Gachibauli and said, I do not want to play badminton any longer. I'm not good enough. And I recognized it from my own experience ki that was the, the most crucial time in the life of an elite athlete, the transition period, which is the hardest, where you want to give up a million times to be able to hang in there and, and, and believe in the process. We gave her a very good psychologist. I think we ensured that there was a very strong team supporting Sindhu. And luckily, uh, uh, the tide turned and she started getting better. Not many people know that exactly nine months to the day of the Rio Olympics, one day Sindhu got a stress fracture on her foot. Uh, we showed her to all the, orth uh, uh, the best orthopedic surgeons, took all the scans. Everyone said very clearly that she's out for around four months. That was the injury protocol. Within 12 hours from the injury happening, we, uh, Gopi, Sindhu, her parents, our team of our physio, trainer, nutrition, mental trainer, we sat together. We prepared a day-to-day -day plan of Sindhu's rehabilitation, her recovery, her strengthening, return to jogging, return uh, to training on court, and finally return back to competition. In exactly three months, 10 days from the date of the injury, Sindhu played her first competitive match again. And I think that was world-class recovery uh, and a world-class rehab program just because of teamwork and the dedication and commitment of an elite athlete who, who, who made it, it, it happen. And when Sindhu eventually went to Rio, she was in the best shape of her life, not just physically, but I would say mentally. She beat three opponents who had better head-to-head -head records than her. All three, uh, uh, all three were higher ranked than her. And when, uh, and you know, I was there at Rio, and I asked Sindhu, Sindhu, what happened? How come you played so well? And she told me something that meant a lot to me. She said, you know, Viren, she was 21 when she won the Olympic silver medal at Rio. Did anyone watch that match? Did anyone watch Sindhu's match? I there a lot of hands going up. And like, we all felt proud, right, seeing an Indian girl going there. And what Sindhu told me made me feel really proud because she said, you know, Viren, in the last seven to eight years that OGQ has been supporting me, the support has been so world-class that every time I stepped on court in Rio, I just believed that I could beat anybody. And for me, that meant so much from a young Indian girl saying that, because I think that in 2004, when the Indian men's hockey team stepped onto the pitch in Athens against Australia, and we stood toe to toe and face to face with them, I don't think deep down at that point of time, we believed that we could beat Australia. And I think belief does not come from you or me saying, telling athletes, Ki, have confidence, have belief. It actually comes from solid world-class support from all of you all, from everyone working in the team uh, with athletes. If we are able to consistently give our athletes the best possible support, I don't see any way that we can't uh, win at the highest level. So for me, uh, uh, Sindhu is just an incredible athlete. She went on to obviously win an, a second Olympic medal at uh, Tokyo also, which was even tougher than the first, just given uh, the circumstances uh, that, uh, that she could go through. Uh, uh, that was me with Sindhu at the Rio Olympics. Uh, Mirabai Chanu, she came from a background so poor, growing up from a small village far away in Imphal in Manipur, Meera did not even have two square meals a day to eat. She used to lift firewood to earn 10 rupees for her family. Hardy, tough girl from the mountains, she became a weightlifter. Now her journey at the Olympics actually started with failure. Because at the Rio Olympics, Mirabai Chanu failed in all her three lifts. Meera is only, she, uh, she's a 49 kg weightlifter. So her weight is, has to be less than 49 kgs. In her weight category at the Olympics, you have to clean and jerk about 115 kilos. So you lift the bar up to here, this is called clean, and then you jerk it up. Okay, 115 kilos, that's about two and a half times her body weight. Again, to give you context, I am 80 plus kilos. I cannot lift that bar two centimeters off the ground. Because if I go to lift more than that, I'm going to get a back injury for the rest of my life. So it's, and this is a 49 kg lady doing that. 
the OGQ team was tracking Mira in the lead up to Rio, uh, and we were. She was not expected to win a medal at Rio, but she was expected to challenge and go very close. So we were very surprised when she didn't make a single clean lift at Rio. And we were curious to find out the reason. So in December 2016, I made the journey to Patiala, uh, which was Meera's training base, to find out what happened. I had dinner with Meera Bai Chanu and her coach, Vijay Sharma. That dinner turned into a four-hour meeting. And in that four-hour meeting, Meera was actually sobbing on the table for more than two hours. Uh, as she was narrating of the, what happened at Rio, she said that mentally, she just the pressure on her was so much that she just blanked out, and uh, and she forgot the process of and weightlifting is a process. If you forget one element of the process, you will not make a successful lift. Uh, she equated it to someone preparing for a very public speech for five years. And then when you go on stage in front of a million people, you forget all your lines. From that talk with Meera, from that meeting with Meera, it became very clear that there were three, four major deficiencies in her training. Her coach was very young and talented. He understood modern training methods. But what she didn't have was the medical support and the a absolutely world-class team working behind the scenes with her. We had to put in uh, place a very good uh, 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 psychologist first and foremost because we had to help her overcome that fear of failure that kept plaguing her every time she went onto the platform uh, to lift in competition after Rio. Second, we had to get a very good nutritionist because we had to keep her weight below 49 kgs yet have the explosive strength to lift 115 kilos. We had to get a very good strength and conditioning expert to work with the coach on technique, because when you're lifting weights that normal people cannot even think of, any mistake in technique and the, the, the probability of uh, injury multiplies a lot. And last, we had to get a very good physiotherapist with her, because like, I, I'm a hockey player, I've seen a lot of injuries, we look after boxers, wrestlers, but I've never seen the kind of injuries that weightlifters get. In the last uh, three months in the lead up to the Tokyo Olympics, Mira on separate occasions had four injuries. She had a back injury, she had a neck injury, she had a shoulder injury, and she had a thigh injury. And each time we thought, oh God, that's it, five years of effort again gone down the drain. But that lady is made of something else. Every time she kept fighting, 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 pushing the pain barrier. And finally, 24th July 2021, first day of competition of the Tokyo Olympics, Mirabai Chanu finally lifted 115 kilos and won the Olympic silver medal. And, and all of us cried buckets of tears. I, I, I cried because I know how hard the journey was for me, for her, and after the Olympics, Meera told me that she did not sleep properly for a month in the lead up to, to, uh, to Tokyo as well. Just the burden of expectation on, on her was, uh, was so much. And uh, uh, for me, she is definitely one of the most incredible athletes. I just want to add another nugget. Exactly three months after the Tokyo Olympics, they had the weightlifting national championship. The number of girls that participated has tripled from the last national championship just because of a hero like Meera Bachano. In the Northeast, every academy is filled with young girls who now believe that, uh, uh, that they will be the next Meera Bachano. Uh, you can see how tiny Meera Bachano is and, and this girl uh, is, is just an incredible young talent. I just want to end by saying I think the greatest pleasure in life is to say that is to do something that people say you cannot do. I think, especially in sport, I've always heard, right, from the time I was growing up, people say, don't play, you'll never get anything, India's useless, we're too bad. Now in OGQ, people say, you all will never win Olympic medals, we are too far behind the rest of the world. I, I just want to say a personal story. You know, when I was 12 years old, I, I was a really tiny kid, very puny, a very short, very thin, this is 12-year-old me, and the, you can see the other 12-year-old, who I was much smaller and tinier compared to. 
And I said, go to the uh, uh, Astrid of Hockey Stadium in Churchgate for training uh, for these summer coaching camps. And I thought I was a very talented hockey player until one day one very senior a coach caught me by the scruff of the neck and he said, Ki, you know, Viren, you're very skillful, you're very talented, blah, 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 but you'll never, ever play big hockey in your life. And I was very upset that this very senior coach is saying that I'll never play a big hockey uh, in my life. And I asked him, sir, why do you say that? So he, he just said, Ki, uh, you know, you're just not strong enough, you're not fit enough, you have zero endurance. I had an asthmatic issue, my breathing, my lung power was really bad. I went home very upset. From, from the next day onwards, every single day I came onto the hockey pitch, I started working on, on my skills. I either learned a new skill every day or I improved on my existing skills. I started going to the gym, I started getting fitter, faster, stronger. And exactly 12 years later, at the age of 24, I captained the Indian hockey team for the first time ever. And, and I was very glad that that coach one day told me that, that you will never ever play big hockey in my life. Because maybe that day if he had to not tell me that, maybe I wouldn't have worked as hard as I was supposed to work to get where I was supposed uh, to be. And so I just want to say that uh, I think, you know, when Geet, Prakash, Vishwanathan, Anand is also on our board, myself, and we started OGQ, uh, we thought that the potential and possibilities of this are good. We, uh, first, we thought we'd just make it a fine program where former athletes help the next generation of athletes do, a, uh, do something. But actually, what we really want to do is make it a movement that can capture the imagination of the entire nation, right? All of you all felt proud when you all saw the video. And that's what we want to make millions of in uh, Indians feel uh, uh, really proud. And I want to say a special thank you to uh, uh, Dr. Joshi, Dr. Uh, Dincho Pardiwala, Dr. Abhay Nene, Dr. Narvekar, Dr. Sanjay Desai, Dr. Sudhir Warrior, many doctors who have helped many of our athletes and many others. I'm sorry if I have not taken your names, Dr. Aditya Daftari. Uh, 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 so many of you all uh, at next to no time always see our top athletes. And we, without that support, these are the one percenters that will get us back. Because in the life of an elite athlete, the window is very short. And that window closes very soon. I, uh, in the previous uh, session, Dr. Agarwala was saying about recovery time. And it's so important that, 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 that's magnified in the life of an Olympic athlete. Because we have to get them back into action at the quickest time possible. Every time I was out with my finger fractures, I lost my place in the Indian team. I lost my confidence. My fitness level dropped to zero. And I had to fight my way back into the team from scratch. So getting elite athletes back into action is quickest. And very often, it's not just the physical aspect of the injury. It's the psychological uh, aspect, which is the hardest for them uh, to deal with. So, you know, what we want to do is make OGQ a movement that can capture the imagination of the entire nation. I think, as with anything in life, the choice is always ours. Because when we walk out of that, those doors today, I think many people in life will tell us that you can't do this and you can't do that. If there's just one message I like to give, especially young kids, is that if we put our minds and our hearts and our soul and put the best team in the world possible, I think we can do whatever we want in life. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, thank you, Virin. Thank, thank you, Dr. Anand Joshi. Uh, that fantastic, inspirational talk leads us up to our next speaker, who's indeed a youth icon. Dinsha Padiwala recognizes himself as the head of sports medicine in Kukila Bay Nambani Hospital. But to us, he's our representative at the ICC, at the BCCI, 
at everything that's sporty. He's truly redefined orthopedics. Dinsha Padiwala has been, for the BOS has been a multiple times Masala Wala paper award winner and a Young Surgeons Forum winner. But for me, he uh, embodies the phrase, the meticulous Bawaji. My dear friend Dinsha, the stage is yours. Thank you. But before I get on to my lecture, I'd like to say Viren, who's a very close friend, didn't win an Olympic medal for himself, but through OGQ, he's won multiple Olympic medals for India. So thank you, Viren. And Viren spoke about building champions, but as sports orthopedic surgeons, it's for us to ensure that our champions remain champions. And before I start, I'd like to just say a quick thank you to the patients and the athletes who've consented for their names to be included into this presentation. And one more disclaimer, I know as orthopedic surgeons, we love scientific details, but you'll forgive me if for medical confidentiality issues, I can't get into the nitty gritty and the details and the orthopedic details that we'd like for each of these cases. In the Rio 2016 Olympics, Vinesh Fogart, who was one of our medal prospects, sustained a very severe injury to her right knee. She dislocated it. She had to be stretchered off. She went to the local Olympic hospital there and had to be reduced. She then had to be flown back to India where we had to do a surgery on her, a multiple ligament reconstruction. She was very keen to receive her Arjuna Award in person from the president, so we had to put her into a cast, which we normally don't do. So she got into a cast, four days later flew to Delhi, got her award, came back, stuck with her rehab. Seven months later, returned to wrestling, won a silver medal at the Asian Wrestling Championships. And then two years later, the Gold Coast Commonwealth Games in 2018, she won her gold medal. The same year in the Asian Games, she won a gold medal. And this was all done without too much ado, without too much shusha. So what are the strategies that we as orthopedic sports surgeons employ to ensure a quick and safe return to sports following injury in elite athletes? Because injuries will take place, but if we can't get our athletes back on court, on the field, on the mat really quickly, they're going to lose that competitive edge very quickly. And I think that there are seven strategies that we employ, and I'll go through each of these. The first is advanced diagnostic medical imaging. Unlike our normal patients where, of course, you do a clinical evaluation, and then based on that, maybe try a trial of non-operative treatment, and then if that doesn't work, get an MRI done, and then take it based on the merits of the case, in our elite athletes, we like to reach that diagnosis immediately. And that sometimes does mean over-investigating them, but it's best to get that diagnosis quickly. Now, I'll give you two examples. This fast bowler, left arm fast bowler, who presented to me with a vague pain in the shoulder and who had some minor neurological symptoms after bowling 10 overs and not before that, when I clinically examined him, he had almost no signs at all. But we knew that there was something wrong, that MRI was normal, and so we persisted with that diagnosis, and then it's only when we get an advanced study like a CT angio done, looking out for a rare sort of vascular cause, that we found that in that hyperabducted position, he had a pseudonandrism of the axillary artery, which was then causing his distal symptoms and which required a surgical excision. So sometimes we really need to push with our investigations. One more case, a badminton player with anterior knee pain. And if you look at the MRI, that MRI looks not that bad. This is not a significant chondral injury. But it's only when we get the degemric, the delayed gadolinium enhanced MRI done, that we notice that it is quite a significant injury to that articular cartilage. And when we get the T2 mapping we done, we see that this is a large zone of degeneration. And on that, she's got a small little chondral crack there. So this completely changes the treatment and the prognosis of return to play in an athlete. So I think the first point is making sure that you've got a quick diagnosis, 
with the sort of investigations that you need. The second is decision making. And it's always the decision between surgical versus non-surgical. And this is a critical decision because you don't get a second chance. Unlike our normal patients where you'd give them a trial of non-operative treatment and if that doesn't work, maybe two months down the line, we'll think of employing a surgical cure. In these patients, because time is short, you need to take that call early. Is my non-operative treatment certainly going to get this player back? Because if it's not, then I better employ a surgical treatment that's going to get him back faster. Take, for example, shoulder dislocations. So if you land up with an anterior shoulder dislocation, something that this player had, a classical hyperabduction injury. So he's fallen, his arm's gone into abduction with external rotation, and he's landed up with his first time anterior dislocation, which of course was reduced there by the sideline. Now, a player like this, because he's a right arm fast bowler, is going to require a surgical treatment, which otherwise we would have done a non-operative treatment for. So if it's the non-dominant arm, or if it's not a contact athlete, we may opt for a non-surgical treatment. But if it's a player for whom this is the dominant arm, it's probably best to go ahead and stabilize this early itself. And so the whole concept of primary repair for first-time anterior shoulder dislocators. And what do we do in that? Arthroscopically go down and get your anatomical repair. So you've got the torn anterior labrum there. We put in anchors, take bites through the suture, take bites through the labrum and the anterior glenohumeral ligament and get back an anatomical repair. So if we've got a nice taut anterior glenohumeral ligament here and we've got our concavity compression effect restored, then his static stabilizers will do their job and his dynamic stabilizers can then be used for strength and for generation of pace and don't really need to be working as the secondary stabilization mechanism. So sometimes for our athletes, we'll choose surgical treatment over non-operative, unlike our normal patients. Similarly, in muscle tendon tears, this fast bowler with a left-sided quadriceps, this is a central rectus tear, this is something that we might treat non-operatively in normal patients, but in our elite athletes, if someone needs to sprint, this footballer is going to get a primary repair, which is then going to enable to get back, get back to sports earlier and prevent recurrences in the future. I remember in our residency days, we used to do adductor tenotomies under local anesthesia percutaneously, and most of our patients used to adapt well to those. But if a sportsman lands up with an adductor longest tear like this one here, and this is an avulsion straight off the bone, this is again something that we'd like to go ahead and repair primarily. So put in suture anchors, repair that adductor longus, and typically these are associated with an extension which goes into the core muscles and the rectus. This too would need to be repaired. So again, a little more aggressive approach in elite athletes as versus normal recreational athletes. And also for ankle sprains. Typically, we treat ankle sprains non-operatively in most of our patients, but in an elite athlete like this badminton player who's landed up with a ATFL and a calcaneofibular ligament CFL tear, this is something that we will do a primary repair for because this gives that player the best opportunity for restoring anatomy and therefore being able to restore and getting back to sports. The next strategy is arthroscopic surgery whenever possible. So we know that minimally invasive procedures enable our athletes to return back to sports faster than open procedures and should be used as and when possible. So take, for example, this injury. This is a goalkeeper who's got a direct impact on his proximal tibia. And you'll see that direct impacts land up with a PCL injury. Now, if you had to do a PCL reconstruction open, that's a significantly morbid procedure that's not going to get him back for at least a year, whereas doing an arthroscopic single or a double bundle reconstruction will enable him to get back to sports in about six to seven months. So as and when possible, an arthroscopic procedure. And we've seen this in multiple joints, whether it's the shoulder, the elbow, the wrist, the hip, the ankle, the knee, and other areas of the foot, it's an arthroscopic approach that will often uh, give you a faster recovery 
and therefore faster return to sports. The next strategy that we use and which has really helped change the way we treat our patients is technological advances in the medical devices that are available. And industries ensure that we've got devices and implants that are stronger, smaller, and enable a better surgical repair. So take, for example, this young parkour specialist, and he's from Bombay itself. Parkour is a sport that's catching and becoming more popular over the years. And this is a sport that requires a lot of agility, it requires strength, and it requires you to have mobility. Now, when he lands up with an ACL tear, with an MCL tear, and a locked, transected, buckle-handled tear of the lateral meniscus like this, what's called a terrible triad of the knee, if you don't repair the meniscus, this patient is probably not going to get back to normalcy. Now, to repair a transected meniscus is not an easy job. You don't have much space. So this locked meniscus first needs to be reduced. And you'll see that this is a complex tear. It's torn not just radially, but also in the periphery. Now, to repair this, you need devices that are going to be all inside and which are going to fix this meniscus to the periphery first. So this is an all inside device that achieves that. And then once you've done that, you need instrumentation that's so small that can get into that small lateral compartment and that one or two millimeter needle can pass the suture through and you can suture that entire meniscus back into anatomic congruity. So something that you'd do with a complex fracture of putting all those pieces in position, you do that with the meniscus. And for many years, we believed that the menisci did not heal. But you'll see when we do this second look arthroscopy, when we go down for his ACL reconstruction, because we've done his MCL repair and his lateral meniscus repair in the first stage, when we go down in the second stage to do his MCL reconstruction, you'll note that that's the lateral meniscus, that complex tear of the lateral meniscus that's healed out there. And it's only because the lateral meniscus has healed that we can then allow him to get back to his high demand activities. Because without that lateral meniscus, there's no way he's going to be able to get back to his training and get back to the sort of stuff that he wants. So when you've done an ACL reconstruction, a primary repair of the MCL, and you've repaired that lateral meniscus, you've gotten back anatomical congruity, and then that enables this high demand elite athlete to do the sort of stuff that he'd like to do. We do know that repairing and biomechanically bringing back structures to their uh, original anatomy is useful, but sometimes, unless you get healing, you're not going to have normalcy. And that's where orthobiologics and regenerative medicine comes in. And take, for example, this case of a fast bowler with a locked lateral meniscus bucket handle tear. So he's got that flap of the lateral meniscus that's torn off and then locked within the horizontal cleavage tear of the lateral meniscus. Now you'll note that this meniscus tear is in the region of the popliteal zone. Now the popliteal zone has no peripheral attachment and therefore has very poor vascularity and we know that traditionally these tears will not heal. Not only will they not heal but they will progress with time and this small little injury is likely to be a career-ending injury for this fast bowler. Now, knowing that, we know that we do need to repair these stairs. And we can use these very nice, elegant devices to repair them and stitch them up. But if we don't get healing of the two leaves of the horizontal cleavage stair, this repair is not going to function. And that's where autobiologics come in. So what we then use is an exogenous fibrin clot. So we take some of the patient's own blood prepare an exogenous fibrin clot, insert that clot in between the two leaves of the meniscus. And there are a few studies now which have been published since many years which show us that these exogenous fibrin clots enhance healing. They help with the biology. They help as a chemotactic factor to enable the healing process. And once you've got that sandwiched in there between the meniscus, you'd go ahead and repair it and stitch it up. And you'll note that that's the repair, and six months later, your MRI shows that it's a healed repair, and this young boy went back to bowling seven months following his surgery. 
Now, orthobiologics are used in multiple other sites and we've got an entire symposium on them uh, coming up tomorrow. Though I would warn you that this is still an evolving science and not everything that's proposed to achieve what it says it will, will. So when you're using an orthobiologic, it's worthwhile to be sure that what you're using is going to be useful. The next, and I think that this is really critical, and Virain alluded to this in his presentation too, is advances in sports rehab and technology and sports biomechanics. When Neera Chopra tweeted this photograph after winning the Olympic gold in 2001, everyone, I think, appreciated his effort, but I think people didn't really realize the effort that went into the rehabilitation process following his elbow arthroscopic surgery. So you can do an elbow arthroscopic reconstruction, but if you can't get that elbow to get back full range, full strength and stability, and thereafter get back explosive strength, ensure that you can generate the biomechanics from the core to the shoulder and get back your throwing mechanisms, there's no way that you'll achieve what you ultimately want to achieve. And I really like the OGQ uh, you know, motto, it takes six grams to lift the worth of a nation. And you can see that this one particular throw lifted the worth of over a billion people. And that's possible because of the extensive rehab that he's done and the extensive biomechanic corrections that have gone into ensuring that he can throw stronger and better. And finally, a better understanding of sports biomechanics. This is something that we just didn't give attention to initially. We can restore anatomy, we can get back range and function, but if we can't get back biomechanics, then that sportsman is probably going to be ineffective. And I think the best case example for this is this fast bowler that we operated in 2014. He had an ACL tear and a lateral meniscus root tear. And of course, he underwent an ACL reconstruction with a lateral meniscus root repair. But what we had to analyze was his biomechanics because he had not only a very awkward bowling action, but he required 20 degrees of hyperextension. And we know that hyperextension in the left, because he's a fast right arm fast bowler, the knee extension angle at ball release dictates how fast you're gonna be able to bowl and how accurately you're gonna be able to bowl. So to get back that 20 degrees of hyperextension in the left side post-surgery, and to ensure that it's stable at that range is important for this fast bowler to get back to 100%. And I think that that understanding of sports biomechanics then enabled him to get back to the best that he could be. So these are the seven strategies that we employ as sports orthopedic surgeons to ensure that our athletes can get back as quick and as, as safely as possible. Now how successful actually are we in this process. So we analyzed the elite athletes, and by elite we define them as either players uh, in cricket who had represented India at any stage, or for non-cricket as players who represented India at any stage in their career. So when they had an injury and they underwent surgery, how many of these could we return to sport, that's RTS, but more importantly, how, could you, how many of these could we return to performance, RTP? And we analyzed these cases that we had done from 2015 to 2021. And yes, return to sport may be very encouraging. 96% return back to sport. But only 9 out of 10 could get back to their original level of performance as they had prior to the injury. Which means that we still have to help that 1 out of 10 player and that's where we need to really ensure we get in the coming years. So what are the things that defeat us? So injuries which are very severe combat injuries in which there's a bony element, like this girl who had a prior ACL reconstruction but then had a fractured dislocation of the knee with significant articular cartilage and meniscus loss. I think these are the sort of injuries where bones involved, multiple ligaments involved, meniscus losses involved, articular cartilage losses involved. I think these are the ones that still defeat us. The second ones that defeat us is our slightly older athletes with degeneration. 
We're seeing degenerative joint disease at a much younger age, like this 27-year-old male wrestler. You can see what his shoulder looks like, almost like a 70-year-old's. Or this 31-year-old male football player, his cartilage is completely lost on, the, on his medial femoral condyle. So degenerative joint disease is still a big, big challenge for us. And hopefully in the years ahead, we'll be able to get our slightly older athletes also back to sports with improvements in orthobiologics and maybe other technologies that come in. Virain mentioned that it's important to build champions. But if India's destiny as a sporting superpower really is to be achieved, I think our medical science, our sports science, and our sports orthopedic support really can't be lacking. And I think that we've really improved over the last 15 years. We're standing on the shoulders of giants, but I think that we still have a long way to go. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Dinsho Padiwala, thank you for making us so proud and thank you for keeping our athletes on track, Dinsho. The strength of an ox, the eyes of a hawk and the heart of a tiger, that's what defines an orthopedic surgeon, isn't it? So, uh, in keeping with that theme, uh, the last presidential lecture uh, takes us to the wild side uh, to introduce the Dean of the Wildlife College of India. We have, um, again, someone in the same theme, someone with the strength of an ox, the heart of, an, of a lion and the eyes of a hawk, our past secretary, uh, Dr. Rujuta Mehta. Sure. Please. Ladies and gentlemen, I will not stand too much between your presidential guest speaker and you, but I think it's a proud privilege to belong to the same school as Mr. Yadavendra Jhala. Some of us have been hearing about real life heroes and human work and there are some heroes in the background who do inhuman work because it is literally not with humans and not possible for a lesser mortal like us. And they make such a lot of difference, not just to the country, they do the country proud, but also they make a huge difference for generations to come. For those of you who are not familiar with Mr. Jhala, Dr. Jhala has led a long-term research project on the Asiatic lions. Mr. Jhala has been working on the Project Tiger, where he designed and implemented uh, on national scale for the population assessment of tigers and other carnivores. And his uh, uh, wildlife survey has been uh, put in the Guinness World Record. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Mr. Yadavendra Jhala, the man who brought the cheetah to India after extinction. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mehta, Dr. Gandhi for inviting me, Virok for organizers for giving me this pedestal, my school teacher, Ket Kiben, my friend, Dr. Ravi Gupta, esteemed gathering of orthopedic doctors, Namaskar. Um, I work for the government the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. We are actually the technical arm of the Ministry, Wildlife Institute of India. Primary role is to train forest officers in managing national parks and wildlife sanctuaries. We also do research and uh, I'm an academician. Um, the criteria of judging academicians is how many scientific papers you produce, how many grants you raise, but when your research actually gets translated into conservation actions, it is like Soneme Suhaga. And I'm going to tell you how science has been used in wildlife conservation in India and how research has actually guided policy and management in our country. Scientists don't even know how many species exist on this planet. The estimate is anywhere between 10 to 30 million. But it's a guesstimate. We don't know that. Just like birth and death, evolution and extinction, are the two sides of the same coin. Any species which evolves is bound to become extinct. Today, after the loss of the dinosaurs 65 million years ago, 
we have again in the Anthropocene reached an extinction crisis. The background levels of extinction have been increased 100 to 300 fold. And this is because there is a single species that evolved on this planet about 2 million years ago, us. Luckily for us, we humans were also endowed with the intellect by nature to redress the negative actions of us on this planet. We can do that if some of us realize it and act towards solving this problem. In India, the first humans appeared about a million years ago. It is only within the last 40,000 years when humans learned to use fire that we change the habitat to make it more conducive for ourselves and less and less conducive for our conspecifics, the biodiversity of this planet, which started declining because of us. But it is in the last 2,000 years when we establish civilizations that our impact has escalated to a global extinction crisis. And some of our jobs, like the one I do, is to prevent this extinction because of which is caused by anthropogenic means. India shares a huge amount of biodiversity compared to its geographical area and the population pressures that we face. We still have a lot of animals and plants, microbes, organisms which you deal with on our area of the planet compared to the other parts of the world. And this has survived on our planet primarily because of the religious and cultural attitudes of our people towards nature. In the Western world, usually the Western religions, the Abrahamic religions with no offense to any religion, talk about humans as being dominion of nature. We conquer nature for its use. The Eastern religions of Hinduism, Buddhism and Jainism talk about custodianship of nature. And this basic difference has allowed nature to persist on our part of the world compared to the other parts of the world. It's not because of the forest department or scientists or managers who've done this, but it is the people of India who have conserved nature for millennia. However, our attitudes and values are fast changing. The population pressures on this planet are fast changing, um, and that creates a crisis for our area. When we have 1.3 billion people living in India, the pressures are humongous. The GDP which we maintain, the development which we do, is all impinging on the human footprint which are creating in our part of the world. It was not only the ethics of conservation, but when the world was a barbaric part in the western side, we actually indoctrinated the principles into policy and law. And the first policy on nature conservation can be seen by in the Arthashastra of Chanakya. The Yellowstone National Park is considered to be the first national park in the world, 1857 or something like that. But during the time of Ashoka, we had Abhayaranyas in our country about 400 BC. So India has been a leader in conservation and we take this leadership in the modern era as well. When I started work with tigers, that was in 2002, I had been um, uh, working with lions and other, other carnivores initially. But in 2002, I was asked by the ministry to help them assess tiger populations across the country. And that point in time, we were going through a crisis in tiger conservation. We had lost two tiger, tigers in two tiger reserves, Sariska and Panna. The prime minister had formed a tiger task force. And one of the major limiting factors in tiger conservation was false numbers of our populations. Now, counting wildlife is like counting crows um, in Delhi. And if you remember the famous episode where Akbar asks Birbal that how many crows are there in Delhi, Birbal very bitterly answered that it's like close to be about 10 lakh crows in uh, Delhi. So Akbar was surprised. He asked, how is it possible that you know this? He says, sir, just count them. He says, you know it's impossible to count crows. He says, you count them and you'll find them to be about 10 lakhs. What if there are more? He says, oh, the neighboring Villages, you know, the crows are visiting their relatives in Delhi, and that's why the number is more. What if the number is less? The crows from Delhi are visiting their relatives outside. So it is a, you know, it's a no-win situation. You can, you can say anything you like. And at that point in time, we had a population estimate of about 3,500 tigers in India, official record. When we did this with a scientific method, we found that there were only around 1,400 tigers left in our country. And this shook the entire policy 
of the government of India and the subsequent research which came through with our work was actually uh, changed the Wildlife Protection Act. It was enacted in the parliament and the act was amended and a lot of reforms took place. Now the question is how do we do this? Just like you have fingerprinting for humans, we fingerprint tigers based on their stripe patterns. Each tiger has a unique stripe pattern. So if they take selfies of themselves when they walk on forest trails with remote cameras, you can use this information in counting tigers. But there are problems associated with that. Tiger doesn't, you know, give a very nice selfie. It, you know, may give you a side profile, front profile, and you don't always get the fingerprint right. So you have to have computer models which correct for pitch and roll and artificial intelligence which allows you to compare one tiger from another because it's humanly impossible to do that. We also use this information to fight tiger crime. For example, this skin which was seized in, um, I don't know if this shows up here, no it doesn't, but if you can see the skin here which was seized in Kathmandu, um, it was traced, you know, you could trace it to a tiger in Paint Tiger Reserve in Madhya Pradesh where the live tiger was photo captured. So we maintain a repository at the Wildlife Institute of India and you can get to the hot spots of poaching and address those because you know where the tiger crime is coming from. So as um, Dr. Mehta mentioned, uh, this survey, the last survey which was done, not by me, but I was, I'm the lead scientist on that. It was done by the forest department of all the tiger states along with the National Tiger Conservation Authority. Uh, we got the Guinness Book of World Records for the largest wildlife survey connect, conducted on this planet. And you can see the effort which is put in. About 44,000 people working across the country, about five lakh kilometers of walk. Um, we covered an area of about 33.8 lakh square kilometers. Uh, and we found that tigers occupied about 88,000 square kilometers. So each blue dot which you see on this map of India is a trail which is walked by a forest guard. And whenever he sees a tiger sign, either it's a pug mark of a tiger or a fecal matter of a tiger, it's marked in red. So you can get a distribution map of the tiger itself. And this, then we go in and put camera traps and we take photographs of all wildlife. So the tiger census actually helps in assessing the entire biodiversity of a forested area in the country. Now I'll just give you a small brief because it's a scientific talk. Oh, that's, thanks a lot, but I, need, I don't need this, so thank you. Ah, this is much better off. So this is, I'll just explain to you how this technique works. And uh, this is a map of India, which shows you where the tigers are, their population extent. I'll just concentrate on this part of the Tarai, the foothills of the Himalayas where the tiger population is. And uh, if you see this, this, this green swiggles each represents a walk by the forest guard. It's about five kilometer walk, and it covers the entire area in which tigers are found in the Tarai landscape. So this is Uttarakhand, this is Corbett Tiger Reserve, uh, this is Pilibhit and Dudhwa over here, this is Bihar, Valmiki. So you can see the extent right from Uttarakhand all the way to Bihar. And this area is Nepal. So just to orient you, after that, once you know this, we find out where the tiger signs are. So these red dots tell you where the tiger signs are. Subsequently, we put camera traps, so about 3,500 cameras, remote cameras are deployed in this area, and we photograph tigers, okay? So we photographed about 598 tigers based on their unique stripe patterns. But mind you, not all tigers like to be photographed. They may not come in front of the camera. So there is an issue of detection. Okay? So need to be addressed through statistical models. And also you can't deploy cameras across where the tigers are found because cameras are expensive, they get stolen, and so on and so forth. So they, that all needs to be accounted for. And after accounting for detection probability, that is tigers not appearing in front of the camera, we develop statistical models which allow you to predict the tiger numbers in an area with a reasonable level of certainty based on statistical confidence limits. So the model here, we look at tiger sign, Wherever tiger sign increases, that means more encounters of pug marks or scats, that is fecal matter, the tiger density increases. Wherever there's more human disturbance, tigers decline. And wherever there's more food in the form of prey, again, tiger populations increase. So this gives you a tiger estimate of this area. Now this uh, was actually telecast on National Geographic, made a nice film. I hope this voice comes. I'll just stop this for a sec. Uh, you need to attach that. Sorry about that. 
when we use technology, it has its own glitches, but I think this should work. Yeah. percent of the world's It's just a Our teaser. Our loss in tiger population over the years. India, home to 70% of the world's tiger population, is turning the needle on the global tiger population. Every four years, the Indian government undertakes a count to check the health of the population of tigers. National Geographic brings you the story of India's national animal and the community of passionate officers involved in the biggest ever tiger head count. Tigers need protection, so if you have good protection regime and you have good food, tigers bounce back. Celebrate the moment of hope, pride and perseverance. Counting Tigers, premieres 7th August, Wednesday, 8 p.m. on National Geographic and Hotstar. So this gave us a lot of global um, coverage. It was uh, screened in nine countries and uh, it was wonderful to so see the efforts of the Indian government being portrayed across the world. Now this here is something which is familiar, may be familiar to you. This is using uh, microsatellites, uh, genetic markers. Each bar represents a tiger here. So there are about 156 tigers from across India. And we're looking at the population structure of tigers to tell us if there are any unique genetic populations which need special attention for conservation and are actually declining. So what you see is the northeastern tigers, which is in Arunachal Pradesh, Assam, and those areas are very different from the rest of the tigers. The central Indian tigers are extremely diverse genetically because it's an amalgamation of South Indian tigers, which are also genetically unique and different, and this is an amalgamation zone having the maximum diversity. So we actually tell, advise the government that the priority should be given to this area where there is a very little representation, the tiger population is actually depressed, as well as in the southern western Ghats where the population are decreased. And this has been translated into the standard operating procedure by the government of India of where tigers should be artificially moved when you need to move them, mix them, and so on and so forth. The same work has been done with leopards. Dhol is the Indian wild dog and you can see the genetic structure. The, dhol, the leopard, for example, doesn't have a structure at all. And it is all mixed population. And that's because the leopard can move across human habitations as well, unlike the tiger, which needs forested corridors to move from one area to the other. The dhol also, the population is extremely mixed, except for this population, which is from the Tarai area, northern area. And that, I believe, is because there are wild dogs present in the trans Himalayas, and it is gene flow from that direction as well. For snow leopard, found in the higher reaches of Ladakh and um, Sikkim and Himachal Pradesh, um, we use a different technique because, of course, the spots on the leopard are also unique to them. But because of the long fur and the wind, it's, you can misidentify them. The, the spots change from one photograph to another. So we developed a new technique of photographing the forehead and developing a model based on the markings on the forehead where the fur is short and the movement of the spots is not so much. But how do you get a leopard to actually give a selfie on its forehead? So we use an ingenious device, Kevin Klein perfume. The leopards just get inquisitive with this perfume and they go to investigate. So if you were to spray a little bit on the ground and then put a camera, you get a nice portrait of the snow leopard facing that and looking at it. And then we put transmitters on many of them uh, satellite collars, which give you information of where their movements are and so on and so forth. And we use this to estimate their population, their habitat use, and so on and so forth uh, across uh, the entire state of Ladakh. So again, this is the same thing what we do with tigers, and I will not beleaguer this uh, due to lack of time, but this is using sign surveys, occupancy surveys, subsequently with camera traps, and you can come up with an estimate of snow leopards um, across the Himalayan states, which is far more difficult. Looking at lions, this used to be the historical distribution of lions, and of course, as you know, lions are only found now in the state of Gujarat, in Saurashtra landscape, and the protected area of lions is this gear protected area, which consists of a national park and sanctuary. But in the last 15 years, lions have dispersed out of this protected area into a human-dominated landscape of about 30,000 square kilometers, where they share space with people. So you can have lions living in your backyards, and the people of Saurashtra have learned to live with these animals, which are 
quite dangerous actually. So how do we count the lions? Lions don't have body markings. Yeah? So they have, you can't take a photograph and identify one lion from another. So we devised an ingenious way of looking at their whiskers. Lions have spots on their whiskers and these are unique to every lion. The probability of mixing up two lions is about one in 10,000. So we use this information in a software and then estimate their populations using models known as specially explicit mark recapture. The crux of the story is, due to the human pressures in our country, the size of our protected areas are too small. Lions, for example, these are home ranges of lions. You can see they are much larger than the gear protected area. There are about 1,700 lions living in 13,000 square kilometers, not all of them within the legal realm of protected areas. Tigers, if you see, we have the world's largest tiger population. About 65% of the global tiger population is in India, and the largest populations of tigers in the world exist in these three landscapes. But most of them live outside of protected areas. The possibility of, you know, you can't fence our areas. Just like Kruger National Park, if some of you have gone on a safari to South Africa, you'll realize that 20,000 kilometers, square kilometers of Kruger is fenced with an electric fence. So they have a direct zonation where people and wildlife don't mix. They don't, they don't tolerate conflict at all. In our country, people live with wildlife, and that's the difference. And there are conflicts, and these conflicts need to be mitigated urgently. We cannot afford to fence our protected areas because they are just too small. We also need to estimate how many of these large carnivores can actually fit into our, in our reserves. And for that, you need to estimate something known as carrying capacity. How many animals, tigers, lions, can be fitted into, say, a national park? And this is directly based on a relationship between the density of prey and the density of tigers. You can see it's a pretty good fit. And this allows us to estimate where, how many animals can be fitted in. I'll just skip this. The second thing which we do is do something known as an insurance policy, but not for individuals, but for populations. It's a risk assessment of how long a population can persist in an area. It is known as a population viability analysis. And what we see here are two different models. One is where a protected area, a national park, let's, let's say, for example, Taroba, which is close to you in Mumbai. Taroba has only 15 breeding tigers. And the male ghat, for example, has 20 breeding tigers. The chances of extinction in the next 50 years is very high in Taroba, just because of sheer size of the population. This is estimated by knowing at the birth rate, the juvenile mortality, just like you do in insurance. Um, Interbirth intervals, uh, fecundity, survivorship of adults, and these are the population demographic parameters which are required, but you can actually predict the life of a population based on this. So this population viability analysis subsequently gets translated into the size and design of your nature reserves. For example, to sustain 20 breeding units, you need anywhere between 75 to 100 tigers in the core area of a tiger reserve, and together, the population is about 100 tigers, and that is viable for the long term. So this is part of the management planning for tiger reserves at the landscape scale. And, but how do you create space in a human population of 1.3 billion people for biodiversity? Because tigers act as an umbrella. They are at the apex of the food chain. So if you conserve the tiger, you're conserving the entire biota. It's not a single species conservation program, but more of a biodiversity conservation program. Because if you, you know, have the top part of your ecosystem functioning well, the rest of the ecosystem functions are going to be doing well as well. So our strategy is to create space in the core area by moving people out. Unfortunately, the legal system in India you can, you know, we don't have right to property. It's not a fundamental right of Indians. You can evict people for creating a dam, industry, widening of roads, but you cannot evict people for conservation. Okay? That's the Forest Dwellers Act, or it's called the Forest Rights Act of 19, um, 2006. But you can't stop people from moving out if they want to move out voluntarily. So the Wildlife Protection Act gives an incentive of 15 lakh rupees per adult in the family to voluntarily move out of the core areas of a reserve. And this is the major 
strategy by the government of India to create space for wildlife. It is great for people as well because if you're living in the forest, you're conflicting with wildlife, they're eating your crops, they can kill your kids, uh, there's no education, there are no schools, there are no hospitals, no electricity, no marketplace to sell your products. But if you live outside, mainstreaming of society, then all this is available to you and it's a win-win situation. It's a great vote bank because the people are very happy. They're going to you know, give you votes. So the politicians love it, the people love it, and biodiversity loves it. So this is a strategy which is used by the government of India, which is not present anywhere in the world. So this is something which we need to be very proud of. So we are creating space for carnivores, for biodiversity as such. So what we want to do is have a landscape like this. This is a satellite view of central India. This is Kana Tiger Reserve in Madhya Pradesh, Achanakmar in Chhattisgarh, Pench again in Madhya Pradesh, Satpura land over here. And you can see this is the forested area. So if tigers can move across these forests from one tiger reserve to another, perfect. This is what you want to do where populations are linked. There is gene flow between these reserves. However, if you put just roadways on it, infrastructure, these forests are fragmented. And this, you have to move, tigers have to move across these barriers. So what we do is we model the optimal pathways which animals are likely to take using modern theory of circuitscape. It's just like current flow between the least pathway of resistance. And as you see, these yellow areas are the paths of movement between these tiger reserves. These pink areas are cities, which are barriers. This is um, the city of Nagpur, the city of Jabalpur, and the highway number seven passing and cutting this corridor between Kana and Pench, forming a barrier to tiger movement. We see that genetics as well shows that actually tigers are moving across these landscapes, despite these barriers, but for how long? Especially when these roads become freeways with six laning, they will become barriers to gene flow. So the idea is then to create green infrastructure. So our research directly flows into showing mitigation strategies where you have India's first and the world's largest wildlife mitigation infrastructure on highway number seven, which connects Nagpur to Jabalpur. And under this highway, we have tigers crossing from one area to the other. So this is directly an outcome of research. Shifting gears, I will talk about a bird, um, the great Indian bustard, which almost became our national bird instead of the peacock. It was proposed by Dr. Salim Ali, but unfortunately the name, bustard, if it is mispronounced, it can have a huge connotation. And therefore this bird was not selected as the national bird of India. And today this bird is in Raya states. There are less than 130 individuals surviving on this planet and a few populations in India. Just one actually in Rajasthan, in Jaisalmer, which has about 100 birds. The rest are two or three or four birds. In Maharashtra, there's a single female living in Sholapur. In Gujarat, there are three females living in Kutch. The primary reason for the decline of this bird has been collision with power lines. It's such a heavy bird that when it flies, it, it, it cannot see. And I've got a small film to show you on this, so I will not take much time. The film is self-explanatory. So what we have done is, as a policy against total extinction, as an insurance policy against total extinction, we have started a conservation breeding program where we harvest eggs from the wild, hatch them, and their progeny we hope to put back in the wild once the threats that caused their decline are addressed. So these birds are habituated and they'll be used for breeding. Okay, I'll just show you this film which explains how we do this. Bustards are one of the heaviest flying birds and they have no frontal vision. So when they fly, they do not expect barriers in the sky. And the modern power lines cause most of their deaths. As you can see, the bustard here has collided with the power line emanating from the windmills, which are the source of green energy. Considering the declining population of the great Indian bustard, the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change mandated the Wildlife Minister of India to commence a conservation breeding program as an insurance against total extinction of the bustard in the wild. We're going to take you through the conservation breeding facility set up at SAM in the Desert National Park, a collaboration between the government of Rajasthan and the Wildlife Institute of India, and a temporary facility has set up, been set up at the SAM dunes. The old guard quarters at SAM 
were transformed into a conservation breeding center with the help of the International Fund for Hobara Conservation. Scientists from IFHC Abu Dhabi helped us in designing it and setting the conservation center up at SAM. The facility here includes an incubator for incubating eggs which are secured from the wild. Subsequently, there is a hatchery in which the, uh, the newborn chicks are kept, fed up to the age of about 10 months to about a year. The live feed facility is also maintained here. The area is made totally predator proof so that rodents or other carnivores like dogs and foxes cannot access the eggs or the chicks and we can rear them with utmost security. The process commences with the location of breeding females that are nesting and this requires a lot of field effort. Our field teams are well equipped. We had trained experts from IFHC who assisted our teams in locating females on nests. The regular movement of females within a localized area and a center homing place allows us to determine whether the female is nesting or is just wandering around on our foraging trips. So our team was able to locate several nests and with the permission of the government of Rajasthan, we were able to secure nine eggs this season and put them in the incubator for hatching. We have almost had a 100% success rate till now and there are seven chicks which are born and reared in the conservation breeding sector at SAM. Once the egg is collected, it is cleaned and weighed. The transportation from the nest site to the center is done in a vehicle with a chicken. The For incubator is maintained I'll, I'll just at stop a constant here. temperature and humidity. Um, since lack of time, I'll talk about uh, the latest thing. So we now have 20 birds in captivity and uh, hopefully next year they will start breeding and their chicks will be put back in the wild, provided we have safe areas where these birds can live without power lines. The problem is the power lines. So we need at least about 300 to 400 square kilometer areas without power lines. The power lines have to be put underground so that these birds can survive. And that is a major tussle um, between power agencies, Ministry of Environment, and uh, conservation needs of this bird. So um, recently, as you know, on the um, occasion of the the birthday of the Prime Minister of India, Narendra Bhai Modi, um, the first cheetah were brought to India. And I'll talk a little about how, how this, was, this happened. So it is an effort which we've been working on since 2009, and it was fruitified this year under the uh, Modi government. So the cheetah, the name itself is of Sanskrit origin. And unfortunately, ironically, we lost the cheetah in 1947. The last three cheetahs were shot in Chhattisgarh, in Sal forests. But if you look at the history of cheetah in India, you see cave paintings which are about 10 to 20,000 years old in Bhimbetka and in the Chhatrapuj Nala in Madhya Pradesh. So the Neolithic um, people, cave, cave dwellers at that point in time, knew the difference between a leopard and a cheetah and you can see distinctly the body shape differences which come up in, in these cave paintings. Um, Mr. Divya Bhanu Singh wrote up a book known as The End of a Trail and he traced the history of cheetah in India and as you can see, these are all the hunting records of cheetah in India and you can see they range across the entire part of the subcontinent. These, this was the historical range of the animal and you can see how it ranged into India and into Africa. Currently, only 9% of its historical range is occupied by the animal. The rest is all gone. They've been made extinct. These are the countries in which cheetah has been made extinct by human actions. And bringing back the cheetah in India not only serves our purpose of redressing the actions that we have taken on this planet, but also serves to the global objective of conserving the cheetah. So whenever we bring in a large carnivore into an ecosystem, they have a cascading effect on the different trophic levels which they affect. And it acts as an umbrella species as well. So with the cheetah, these are the conspecifics of the cheetah, the caracal, which is less than 100 animals in this country, the Indian wolf, the striped hyena, the Indian fox, the lesser florican and the great Indian bustards are sympatric. They live in the same habitats as the cheetah. So by conserving the cheetah, we create an umbrella which protects the entire biota. The threats that cause the extinction have been abated in our country. Today we have the economics, the science, and the political will to bring back this animal. So that's the idea of bringing it back. The first site in which we plan to reintroduce, the, we have reintroduced the cheetah is in Kuno National Park in the state of Madhya Pradesh. This is a 750 square kilometer human-free national park embedded in a landscape 
which has good habitat for the cheetah of about 5,000 square kilometers. So there is enough space for the cheetah here. And there are many aspects which we need to consider before we bring in the animal. The most important is disease aspects, which will be familiar to you. Because when you bring in animals from Africa, just like you know, we had a lockdown for COVID, these animals can bring in novel pathogens into our country, which our carnivores and our wildlife is not exposed to. And that would cause catastrophic problems of epidemics possibly in our country. So we need to avoid that. So we screen these animals for diseases. There's a disease risk assessment uh, done, um, and that is a published document. After that, after screening for diseases, we vaccinate them for diseases in India because they have no immunity against the diseases present in our country. So this has to be done, and there's a quarantine of one month in Africa and a quarantine of one month in India before that is done. Other concern is that conflict with humans. When you bring in a large carnivore, living with people can be very difficult. And the cheetah is one of the best carnivores to have in your neighborhood if you are going to have a carnivore because there's not a single record of a wild cheetah killing a human being. So these people in this landscape have been living with tigers and leopards. Having a cheetah with them is going to be a piece of cake. Also, the cheetah, when the prime minister released the cheetah, the gates were open, the land prices, the real estate around this area escalated hundredfold. The price of land, which was 20,000 rupees a bigger, became 25 lakhs per bigger. So people have become rich overnight. And when communities profit from a conservation action, they are likely to support it. They know that it is because of this animal that we are rich today. And if we kill it, we are going to be in trouble. So I'll go to the process of how we did this. And you can see some of the glimpses of um, um, the cheetah. Uh, we, you know, and I'll, I'll just show you some, uh, a little bit of a documentation. So the cheetah were captured in uh, Namibia uh, and South Africa by helicopter, crated, uh, given an anti-anxiety tranquilizer so that when they are transported in this beautiful plane with the, shape of a, with the face of a tiger, they are not stressed. An MOU was signed with the government of Namibia. That's the vice, pre uh, vice uh, deputy prime minister of Namibia and our minister of environment. We had cheetahs brought in by helicopter, army, air force uh, helicopters, and in these crates. And then they were put into quarantine bomas. The prime minister uh, released the first three animals on Indian soil after 70 years of their extinction. The cheetah has been a major evolutionary force in the subcontinent. The speed of the black buck and the chinkara are shaped by this species. Bringing back a large carnivore at the apex of the trophic level results in a cascading effect in the ecosystem. This has been eliminated by human actions. And today, we witness a bringing back of this evolutionary force. Hopefully, cheetahs like these two and many others from Southern Africa will help establish viable populations in India in many of the reserves that we have. The threats that resulted in their extinction have been abated in our country now. We have created habitat which is suitable for these animals. The prey base is there, the legal system is in place, and the political will is also there. Lastly, I'd like to say that the fate of biodiversity is not in the hands of scientists, conservation, or managers, but on how society views and values it, what it is willing to pay, and how it motivates the political will to conserve it. So here you see the Prime Minister releasing one of my authored reports on the status of tigers. And I think today the political will is there. We need to make the most of it and make conservation happen. Um, I'd like to acknowledge um, support from all these people, mostly my graduate students who have worked tirelessly to collect information and make this happen. Funding sources, the institute where I come from and I worked for 30 years, the Wildlife Institute of India, and I thank the organizers of uh, WERCO for um, calling me here and inviting me. Thank you so much.